Well, good morning and greetings from Chicago. Actually, I'm just outside Chicago on the campus of Wheaton College. This is the first lesson in Unit 4, which is called Thriving Through the Psalms. And I'd like to begin with iFaith Video Sermon 25, which is based on Psalm 22. But why am I personally so excited about the Psalms, which I am? Well, for one, I've been reading it since I became a young Christian. I've read or prayed through the Psalms more than a hundred times. I've preached many sermons from the Psalms and a few years ago even wrote a book called Thrive. Uh, it's called Thrive Using Psalms to Help You Flourish. Well, Psalms are great. For the early church, they were the prayer book. They were the hymn book. In fact, we're commanded in Colossians 2 and Ephesians 5 to sing to one another and to teach one another God's word through songs and through psalms. So the Lord expects us to use the psalms, and they certainly capture the full range of human emotion, from the incredibly joyful to the profoundly sad, everything in between. Well, in this unit, we'll just have two messages from psalms. Uh, today, it's called, Why Have You Forsaken Me? Well, if I were giving it a longer title, it would be Up and Down, emotions in the Psalms. Already you know you're going to relate to this part of God's Word. The next lesson on Psalms is called Anchored in God, Stabilizing Emotions Through the Word. So we're going to talk about the emotions right now, and the next video sermon, Sermon 26, we'll talk about how to stabilize our emotions, how using God's Word regularly can help to anchor and root us and stabilize those emotions. Psalms has, as I, as I said, some emotions are very positive. Think of the final few, uh, like Psalm 148, 149, 150. It's all praise the Lord and hallelujah. Some are incredibly down. Uh, most of the down ones at least give something positive in return, but some just leave you down, like Psalm 88. Uh, some begin down and then they go up. They have a happy conclusion. I think Psalm 73 is like that, and certainly Psalm 22. And that's where we're going to focus now. Now, Psalm 22 is frequently called a crucifixion psalm. And there's a good reason for that. And I'm not here to deny it. But I will say it's really a psalm about a sick man, someone who is mortally ill. In fact, he's so ill, it looks like he's going to die. And those around him are waiting for him to die. Worse, they're simply mocking him. They're blaming him for his own suffering, for his own uh, sickness. You know, this is common thinking in traditional culture that if you do well, you'll be blessed. If you do badly, you'll be cursed. And if you're really doing badly, you must have done something wrong. Psalm uh, 22 is familiar to Christians because of the opening words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we'll come back to that near the end of the message. We will be reading the entire psalm, though for clarity, I have taken the liberty of moving certain verses around. I'm, I'm not uh, correcting the Word of God. It's simply I'll be able to speak on this better if I do it that way. But let's begin at the beginning. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night, but I find no rest. This is someone who's suffering and who's getting exhausted. And he seems to be saying, this shouldn't be. Two reasons, the historical faith, the faith of my fathers, the ancestral faith. He continues, you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you, our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. So our psalmist is saying that God's people shouldn't suffer this way, especially because we're your people. We're not the nations, we're not the pagans, the polytheists, those who worship many gods. But he has another reason, and that's his own personal faith. He says, in effect, I've been following you for a long time, and this is what I get in return. You brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast on you, from my mother's womb, you have been my God. So, but despite the history of faith in his lifetime and in those of his forefathers, 
He's in anguish, and it should not be that way. We continue. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults. They shake their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. This is a really low time. The psalmist describes himself as a worm. He feels that low. Right now, I'm surrounded by worm eaters, birds in the tree above my head. Hopefully they'll give me no anguish. But he's feeling really low. And people conclude that this fellow is suffering because of his own sin. He says, do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. So he feels distant from God. That's a real feeling. Is he distant from God? That's not the same thing as, does he feel distant from God? We know this can happen to those in much less serious situations. Even though we read and we pray, we show up to church, we can still end up sometimes just feeling blah, dry. It feels like God has moved away. Now, normally we're the ones who've drifted, but that's a real feeling. He doesn't just feel distance from God. He feels also loneliness. He is misunderstood. He's disillusioned. In fact, I think he's in shock. Death is a likely outcome, and he actually is alone. Even though clearly others are with him, he is alone emotionally. They're not helping him one bit. They're just blaming him. And yet he's not truly alone because God is there spiritually. So he's alone socially, but not truly alone spiritually. Let's carry on. He, he proceeds to compare these people who are giving him no comfort. They're actually blaming him for his sickness. He's going to compare them to animals, three kinds of animals. Many bulls surround me, and then roaring lions tear their prey, and then dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. So he's praying for rescue, not just from his horrible physical illness, but he's praying for rescue from these persons, the ones who are treating him not as a fellow human being, but as an object, as an object of, of deserved uh, divine disfavor. Now, he carries on and he mentions his, these people again in, as animals in the reverse order. So I, I just read to you 12, 13, 16. Now, if we go to 2021, deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs, rescue me from the mouth of the lions and save me from the horns of the wild oxen or the bull. So you have that order. You have oxen, lions, dogs, and then here we have dogs, lions, oxen. He's thought about what he's going to say. This is a very structured psalm. He's near death. And again, those surrounding him are anticipating his departure. Listen, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. So what's happening here? He says all his bones are out of joint. Now, probably not all 200 plus bones. This is not a collapsing skeleton, but we know what he means. It's awkward, it's painful, it's not normal. And he's dehydrated. His mouth is dried up, tongue sticks to the roof of his mouth. He's already thinking about the dust where the worm is. He's already thinking about the dust when his body is returned to the dust. So this poor fellow, is he dehydrated? Um, what's going on with him? He continues to say, all my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me so they can see his bones. So I guess he's, he's not covered up totally with cloth or clothing, but he's lost weight, which is common when people are dying. And Notice people stare, they gloat. They don't just stare, like catch a look. They stare at him and they kind of smile like, yeah, yeah, you deserved it. So they're blaming him. They're giving him little respect or consideration. He says, my heart has turned to wax. My heart is melted within me. Loss of confidence. It just really hurt his self image, loss of confidence. And they divide my clothes among them and they cast lots for my garment. So people don't care about him. They only care about 
the few possessions he still retains, what they'll get after he dies. They did the same thing to the Lord at Calvary, as we remember. But the psalm is not all negative. As I promised, it starts that way, but then it goes up and becomes quite positive. And we learn about his faith through his prayers and through his expectation. Listen. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Come quickly. He's not expecting the second coming. He wants God to simply to come and deliver him. A very common image in the Bible. Go on. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. That's a key verse. That was Psalm 22, 22. It's actually quoted in the book of Hebrews. It shows that he expected to recover. He knows that his story is going to inspire others. So he says, you who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. So unlike his associates, God has not turned away from him, right? They've scorned him, but God doesn't scorn him. And then from you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. So he's got quite a good confidence here. It's a very different tone to the first part of the Psalms. Would you agree? He's, he's, uh, he's getting normalized now. He's dealing with those emotions. And of course, this is possible for any, any of us can go through some really hard times with our emotions. I mean, I've got plenty of examples in my own life uh, from, it might be the shock of family members or friends just dying uh, from sickness or, and physical pain that happens sometimes in medical situations. Um, the disillusionment sometimes we feel with friends, family, church, leadership, we understand that. But his vision uh, carries us through, and in part because of prayer. Because when we work through our troubles and our feelings, sad or bad, with prayer, good things happen. His vision extends beyond his own immediate situation. Let's read the final words. Geographically, all the ends of the earth will remember him and turn to the Lord. Fantastic. His vision extends into eternity. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive. It reminds me of Isaiah and, and Philippians 2. So you have this geographical vision like uh, Revelation 7. We've got an eternal view uh, and then a generational view. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. Well, this psalm is full of imagery, melting hearts, collapsing skeleton, metaphorical dogs and bulls and lions. This is, I think, what Paul meant in 1 Corinthians 15. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus for nothing, what am I doing? Not literal beasts, but people acting like beasts. And yet the feelings of lowness, abandonment, and helplessness, the feelings are very real. And it's the same for the positive feelings. Psalm 22 is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. No wonder he quotes verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, Jesus knew the psalmist was not forsaken by God. It was a feeling. God did not abandon him. It was a feeling. And neither was Christ forsaken. He was not abandoned. Despite the claim I've heard many times, God abandoned him or even sent Jesus to hell or something like that. No, no, that's to misread the psalm. Don't read just verse 1. Read verse 22. Let us deal with our heaviest and most dangerous emotions. But let's process them not alone, but through prayer, bring them to the Lord with people we trust to share with. When things are bad, let's be patient and let's trust in the Lord. People will hurt us, expect it, but God will never abandon us. He will never forsake us and we can put our confidence and lean on, on that promise. Next time, we'll talk about anchoring our feelings, how to stabilize those emotions. But for this time and this uh, message, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We see that God hadn't forsaken Jesus. He hadn't forsaken the sick man who was the psalmist. And with faith and prayer, he won't forsake you or me either. God bless you and greetings from Chicago.